Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, this is Diana Clark. Welcome to an episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Blaise Aguirre, and he has a resume and a bio longer than my arm. He is an MD, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's an associate professor at the esteemed Harvard Medical School. He's a trainer and specializes in dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder and other associated conditions. He's the founding medical director of Three East Continuum at McLean Hospital and other programs for teens and young adults using DBT to target self-endangering behaviors, as well as other symptoms of borderline personality. He's written books and many articles, and we welcome him and his expertise today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate uh, the invitation. So let's deconstruct just before we talk about what is borderline personality disorder. And for those people who are out there who have absolutely no idea, can you think of a public figure who might represent the symptoms of something, somebody with borderline? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it was interesting. Um, uh, I had some kids on the unit uh, recently who asked me this question and, you know, um, probably the person who was most famous back in the day, um, and at least certainly by uh, the assessment of many leading uh, psychiatrists was Marilyn Monroe. But uh, when you speak to kids today about who Marilyn Monroe was, uh, few know. Uh, you know, more contemporarily, uh, Brandon Marshall, the fantastic uh, uh, football player who played for the NFL, uh, declared that he had borderline personality disorder, received treatment, went on and had a really wonderful uh, football career uh, and is now a TV commentator. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the younger generation, uh, the singer Madison Beer um, has uh, said that she has borderline personality disorder. So across the generations, we see some uh, people who are famous, but certainly they might only be famous for that generation. The other person yeah, I got uh, who's that. a public figure is, is uh, Pete Davidson, uh, has been very vocal about having right. borderline personality disorder. And what is great about that list is when I originally think of somebody with borderline personality disorder, I think of women. And so it's mm -hmm. really helpful to hear that men are exposing their own vulnerability with this particular disorder as well. So... Um, why are clinicians so reluctant to diagnose, number one, when there is a clear therapeutic pathway? And how does that actually hinder patients and their families from getting the help they need? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's such a wonderful question, and it's one that I've targeted uh, uh, ever since I opened a Treatment Center for Borderline Personality Disorder. Um, you know, uh, it, it's 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 quite a terrifying condition if you don't know much about it. You know the the self harm statistics are very high and the suicide statistics are very high. And um, you know I was thinking a little bit about what are other conditions that in the past people were very reluctant to either diagnose or tell their patients about things like HIV AIDS and cancer and other things like that. Um, but one of the things that happens is that as treatments develop. Uh, people become much more comfortable in, in making the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So historically, because there was uh, very little was understood about borderline personality disorder, even though it's actually very common, uh, and um, because there were no uh, quick treatments for borderline personality disorder, uh, 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 you know, therapists were very, very reluctant. They felt that it, it was giving someone a, a lifelong psychiatric sentence. Uh, and uh, because of that would, uh, you know, 
use all other kinds of uh, psychiatric labels except for this one. But the irony is, I mean, or maybe perhaps it's, there's a hypocrisy here, and that is why can we diagnose all these other conditions and not the one that is accurately there? So um, I think it had to do, going back to this, with the fear that people wouldn't get better, number one, and number two, that, uh, that there wasn't a treatment in the early days. And that uh, falsehood, that myth was perpetuated in training and uh, medical school and, and graduate school. I remember it in my own training, you know, in a master's program, that the professors, it wasn't so much a disparagement, but a caution to be careful about how many patients you took on with borderline personality disorder, as if there was no room for number one, them to be on a continuum, and number two, my you know, understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that people with a borderline personality diagnosis at 22 may not have that diagnosis at 30 if they do some really tough work. Is that true? That's absolutely true. I mean, if you get given a really fast uh, Lamborghini car and you don't know how to drive it, you're probably going to be a very dangerous person. If you get given a very sensitive brain and you don't know how to use it, it's probably not that healthy for you and your relationships. Once you know how to use it, once you know how to drive that car, then you become an excellent driver. Once you know how to drive a sensitive brain and, and, and deal with it, you just become a much more effective and efficient person. And by the way, uh, the, I know a lot of uh, 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 colleagues who identify as having had borderline personality disorder in their, in their uh, uh, earlier lives and uh, go on to become excellent uh, uh, therapists uh, because they're just right. now, rather than being sensitive and self-destructive, now they're sensitive and effective. Exactly. So when you think of borderline personality disorder, I think of it for the pedestrian listener as somewhat akin to temperament. Some people are born with more sensitive temperaments than other people. I know it's wiring and I know it's much more complex than that. But tell me, is that why certain treatments are in fact designed for borderline? Can you discuss that just a little bit? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, a treatment has to follow uh, um, a, a philosophy of, uh, or a theory about how a disorder uh, develops. So there's two prevailing theories. Uh, one is that um, people have disrupted attachment uh, uh, styles uh, or connections to, to, to the people that they care about. Um, and another one is that they don't have an ability to control their emotions. To me, this theory, uh, whichever one you look at, doesn't really matter all that much because what we see is that people have trouble regulating their emotions and regulating their uh, relationships. Now, the thing about it is this, if somebody doesn't know how to regulate their emotions, rather than thinking that they are intentionally trying to make other people upset or intentionally getting angry or intentionally getting sad, is, is, is thinking that they don't have the skill to be able to manage very powerful and strong emotions and painful emotions. And so when, when the theory is that they don't have the ability to do so, then uh, the treatment is to teach the ability to do so. So often we tell people, listen, you've got to control yourself but we don't teach how to control yourself. It would be like me telling you, go and ride a bicycle, but you don't know how to ride a bicycle. The kind thing is to teach someone how to ride a bicycle, and then I can tell you to go ride a bicycle. So, so to tell someone to calm themselves when they don't have the ability to do so uh, makes no sense. But often when somebody is upset, we say, we see this with a kid who's throwing a tantrum, you need, you need to settle down, you need to calm down. We never teach them how to calm. Screaming at the or, kid, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you the first. dysregulated <laughs> parent yelling at a right. child to calm down, right? And 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 what that does is it ties in, um, you know, we've got this the, this system in our brain, it's called the mirror neuron system. So imagine that, that, that uh, when you're looking at me, you're looking at a mirror. So in my brain, there's a mirror of whatever's going on for you. And then so when you get dysregulated, it activates my mirror neurons, which start to reflect your dysregulation, your upsetness, and it makes me upset. And often when people who are very sensitive will get pick up on emotional sensitivity very, very quickly, which can be problematic if people are angry. 
Which brings me to another question. Do you see a genetic predisposition in this kind of wiring so that you would see a mother, father, whatever, maybe not diagnosed, but with highly sensitive wiring, having mm -hmm. a child yeah. with this kind of diagnosis? Uh, absolutely. And, and the research actually is fairly consistent on this, that about 60% of uh, 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 emotional temperament is uh, genetic. So, so uh, uh, people with this condition tend to have family members with this with this condition. Now, of course, the environment will play a big role because an emotionally dysregulated parent is also not going to teach their child uh, uh, coping mechanisms for how to deal with it. Uh, but it is true that temperament is uh, in this in this case is about sixty percent inherited. Fascinating. That is not necessarily true with other diagnosis, right? That's other correct. mental health yeah. diagnosis. This is more genetically predisposing than other mental illnesses that I've heard. Yeah. That's correct. That's yeah, that, 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 is, that is one of the interesting and fascinating uh, findings. Uh, and, you know, that, that's not to say that, that, uh, that the environment doesn't play a big role, in which it does. And that's the Linehan theory of DVT, that uh, an emotionally sensitive person inherited their genetics and their biological development and an environment that that is critical and, 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 and harsh and not reinforcing um, is, uh, you know, likely predisposes a person to, to the full condition. Interesting. So what are the tools we're really teaching? We're teaching somebody to calm down. What does that mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's such a, such a great question. Um, and, and we see this uh, uh, all the time. And I tell you, I mean, I think that we should have a course in DBT for Congress, uh, you know, the way that these people <laughs> sort of yell at each other and, uh, and, and how we how we kind of engage with each other. So, so I think that that the, the first step um, is uh, to, to, to fixing anything is knowing what the problem is. If you want to hang up a picture on your wall, you know you're going to need a hammer and a nail. You're not going to get, uh, you know, uh, pliers and uh, and a screw or something like that. So, so you want to know what the problem is. So the first thing we want to know is: Does a person actually know what they're struggling with? They might say, "I am suffering," but how are they suffering? Are they suffering because they've got painful thoughts about themselves? Are they suffering because they have, uh, they're really sad? Are they suffering because they're angry? Are they suffering because they're feeling rejected? Once you have a better sense of the problem, then you can target it directly rather than using some sort of generic approach. And um, so, so, but in order to understand and be able to identify what the problem is, you have to be able to uh, see it and label it accurately. And this is where the practice of mindfulness comes in, that if I can pay attention to like this experience, then I can label it. But here's the thing is that some people don't even have language for what they're experiencing. So then we want to get even more basic. And by basic, I simply mean much more physiological. Okay, you don't know how to, what, what, how to label anger. Tell me what's happening to your heart rate. Tell me what's happening to your breathing. Tell me what's happening to your muscle tone. Tell me what your action urges. Tell me what it is that you want to do. And then we paint a picture for each of these emotions for that particular person. We say, okay, when you get sad, this is what your body does. This is what your thoughts do. This is what you want to um, act on. So, so uh, we get right down to the basic code of emotions in order to help a person understand what they're going through. So in the essence, and if I'm oversimplifying, please give me the thumbs down. In no, some I want to, sense, the, the more simple, the better. <laughs> Go ahead. In some sense, if I were your patient, you would be saying to me, you have Diana's disorder. And Diana's disorder includes these particular symptoms. And here's how we're going to address it. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly right. So, so rather than saying, you know, um, you know, you've got a pneumonia and take an antibiotic uh, and that will kill everything that's uh, infecting you, is to say, this is the way in which uh, uh, your experience of the world and your uh, makeup uh, uh, prevent you from succeeding, from living a life that is 
full, for living a life that is complete. Because just because you're emotionally sensitive doesn't mean you need to suffer. It means that you can succeed greatly. And at the same time, if you're emotionally sensitive, you can, it can be painful. But in your, in your case, it might be that you're suspicious that people are out to get you all the time. And so then, so then that would be the way we would want to, rather than using some sort of blank approach, is to say, okay, this is the way in which relationships break down for you, in which your thinking um, breaks down for you, or your emotions break down for you, uh, your um, behaviors uh, are ineffective. So, so it's, it's very, very targeted when we use the treatment uh, dialectical behavior therapy for your specific needs. Fascinating. Tell me, you know, our clients, our audience are primarily advisors and family members who have resources to be able to pay privately for health care. Is that an advantage with this particular diagnosis? You're going to get me into a kind of a more of a idealistic uh, self mm -hmm. because, because uh, you know, um, in many ways, you know, if we think a little bit about this, uh, when we send kids to school, many uh, schools insist on a physical wellness curriculum, but we don't insist on an emotional wellness curriculum. And so what happens is what if we could teach young children about their emotions, about ability to tolerate distress, about mindfulness, and that they, it's, it's something that they take along with them throughout the rest of their life. And so what happens is that when that child doesn't learn those techniques and then gets uh, to the point where they need my program and my treatment, um, it's much, much more expensive. And the money that we could use to treat one child could be uh, the money that we would use to pay an educator to teach a lot of kids in school. So, um, you know, sadly, um, the, uh, sadly the, 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 you know, the further along you get with struggle, the more expensive it becomes because you need much more focused and expertise attention. Uh, that, that, you know, most borderline personality disorder, as you pointed out earlier on, is on a continuum and, and the vast majority can probably be treated on an outpatient setting. But in our, uh, 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 you know, case, by the time they get to us, they've failed multiple other treatments, have been in hospital mm -hmm. lots of times, have done a lot of self-injury. So, um, so having uh, resources, as with anything else, is going to probably get you uh, 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 more expert care. And it's sad that that's uh, where we are in, 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 in this country. I wish that we could provide this much more uh, broadly, but the truth of the matter is that we, we, we don't and we can't. We don't. Yeah, that is a fact. So as our last question, if you were standing at the frozen peas by the grocery store and somebody came up to you and said, you know, I'm really struggling, my daughter, my son is really dysregulated, seems bent on harming themselves. What is the first piece of advice you would offer those parents? Well, I'm just so glad that you mentioned that you're standing at the frozen pea section because it's the first always thing that by I would the do frozen peas. The frozen pea section. Well, we have we have a skill. You see, a lot of the skill, the things that people do to regulate is to self injure, to take drugs, to do alcohol and stuff like that. But actually, we teach that actually very cold temperatures can help regulate your entire nervous system. So I would take those frozen peas and I'd have them put them across their face so that they could yeah. calm down. But, but you know what, he, here's the thing is, is I would say this, two things. One, um, you need to find a person who is uh, expert in borderline personality disorder. Two, uh, who uh, does a treatment that uh, targets the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. And three, that doesn't do a lot of talking because we spend a lot of time talking in many of the psychotherapies, talking, 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 as if talking is going to cure someone of their borderline personality disorder. Talking is important, but it's neither, uh, it's not, it's not uh, sufficient to, to do the whole thing. It, you know, I can't talk you into riding a bicycle or to play tennis or to play the piano. I need to also teach you the skills to kind of manage it. And so, so yes, there is some talking, but there's also a lot of doing. So what I would say is person has to have familiarity with borderline personality disorder and, uh, and comfort in diagnosing it. Two, uh, uses an evidence-based treatment. And the two ones that are mostly used, but certainly in adolescence, 
dialectical behavior therapy is the number one. But in adult borderline personality disorder, either DBT or, or mentalizing based therapy, MBT, and there are some others. Uh, and uh, three, that is applying a treatment, uh, th that this treatment targets the very deficits or the problems that the person is coming in with and that you can measure um, over time. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what I'd say. And also, here's another thing is that here's the other thing is, is that because borderline personality disorder is so relational, it's not enough just for the person to get help, but you as a parent need help as well. And so there are organizations like the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder. There's um, uh, uh, we a person cannot come to our program if the parents aren't also learning the DBT skills so that we also uh, treat uh, teach the transactional model to say these are things that may have worked very very well for your other kids but for this particular kid who's emotionally sensitive uh, it don't work so well and so what we what what we can do is we want to teach you those skills as well which also for that 40% that might in fact be gener environmental, it is addressing the environmental too with a tool for them as well. That's great. I love yeah, the idea exactly that right. we are bringing families into treatment when in particular, the family may be part of the healing. And I think that exactly. that's essential, yeah. You know, it, it, I think that more than any other condition, the relationship matters in this condition a lot. You know, so people might have, say, major depression, which might not involve the family so much per se, and that anybody would be able to tell that the person is, is depressed. But, but with borderline personality disorder, it often has to do with what happens in the intensity of a particular relationship. So somebody else might say, oh, your child looks perfectly normal to me. But then for you, you know the distress that they're under and what happens to you in your uh, relational difficulties. So, so, uh, but I, the only, so the final thing you were going to ask is that it's, um, I have a lot of hope for this condition. Uh, first of all, I find that people who struggle with BPD um, are often very artistic, very creative, very passionate, very psychologically minded. They just don't know how to use those, those skills in context. And that um, using the right approach for the right amount of time, uh, you know, you, we, we see a lot of uh, a lot of health, and, and we were warned that we would have a lot of uh, tragic loss uh, when we treated very ill kids with this condition, and and we'd be fortunate not to have uh, have to have seen that. I mean, people have struggled. There's no question about it, but but people do get better, and uh, that's the message I would say. Thank you very much, Doctor Aguirre. So I love the idea that people do get better and that we just need to get direct about what they're getting better from and not shy from. And I think so much of what prevents people from getting that very tool-based help that they need is the stigma that something is actually not treatable. So mm -hmm. thank you very mm -hmm. much for coming on this show. For those listeners or people watching today. I want to thank you for joining us. If you would like to like us or rate us on your platform of choice, preferably five stars, but if not, let us know. All feedback is welcome. Thank you again for joining us on Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.